I'd like to introduce the card game OWASP Cornucopia. It's a card game we play to understand threat modeling. Threat modeling is a way for us to identify security weaknesses in our applications. Once the risks are identified, we can then put measures in place to prevent or mitigate the effects of them happening in a real life situation. We're basically trying to help developers understand what hackers are thinking and how they can potentially attack the systems we're trying to protect. Within the pack, there are 80 cards in total. So that's 80 potential attacks. And there are six suits, each a different color. And there are two jokers. The six suits represent different types of attack. Light blue is authentication, who you are. Gold is authorization, what you can do. Green is session management, the period of time between an application verifying those first two. Purple is cryptography, encryption, hashing, obfuscation. Gray is data validation and encoding, understanding trust boundaries and validating across them. And dark blue is cornucopia. This is made up of all the other types of attacks that do not come under the other five topics. The suits are broken down just like regular cards, two through ace. On each card is an attack. The lower the card, the easier the attack is to defend. The higher the card, the harder the defense. And just like in poker, aces are high. But here, that means you get to devise a new attack for that suit. The cornucopia suit can also be a trump suit. So if needed, it trumps the other suits. We play the cards and run a number of scenarios to discover whether there are any problems or flaws within the applications that we build. To score points, you have to select a card and argue that the attack on that card is potentially possible in the application being discussed. Your teammates will try to defend against that attack, but if there is any to-do items to take away from the card, the point is awarded. To win a round, you have to successfully have won a point for the highest card played in the leading suit for that round. To win the game, you have to score the most points. Simple. At the start of the game, two components are introduced. These are high-level diagrams that relate to the system being discussed. One diagram, an architectural diagram, will show the components of the system in place, such as the web server, the application server, and the database server. The other is a basic data flow diagram showing the communication between components. These diagrams may be annotated during the game. Once the relevant diagrams have been drawn on a whiteboard, and the team has been walked through them, the cards are shuffled and dealt until evenly distributed. Once dealt, pick a player at random to go first. To play a card, the player must read out the attack on that card that they have picked, and then convince the team that there is something that they need to do to mitigate this attack. Okay, so I'm going to play an authorization card, um, the four of authorization. So it says, Kelly can bypass authorization controls because they do not fail securely, i.e. they default to allowing access. Um, so I think in this example, if Kelly logs in and she wants to update her user credentials, um, so she perhaps wants to change her password, um, then she doesn't have to re-authenticate when she wants to do that. Um, so if she stayed logged into a computer at some point, in a library, in a cafe somewhere, someone got access to that account, they could update her password without Kelly knowing. This is why I think it's a, a potential attack. I think that's right. I don't think we do re-authenticate on the uh, account page where you can reset your password, so I don't think I can argue with that one. Good. Is there any kind of timeout that we've put on the page? So we might not be re-authenticating, but if she stays logged in for longer than 10 minutes, for example, with no action, does she log out? Or? So, because we're an e-commerce website, the lockout period is 24 hours because we want our users to be able to browse and come back to, to okay. these kind of things. So that, that's an accepted risk from the business. Um, I think the, the major concern we need to put in here is making sure that we can um, we re-authenticate users upon a password change. Um, so Grant, if you want to write that down and we'll, we'll add that to the backlog. So re-authenticate on password change. Cool. And you agree that's a point? Yeah. 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 Cool. When attack is described and discussed, it is either validated and noted down as a to-do item or resolved and crossed off. Valid attacks become backlog items at the end of the game as this is something the team will need to deal with in the real world. Aaron, so you uh, now follow the suit. So if you have an authorization card, you're supposed to play it at this point. If you don't have an authorization card, you can play a card from any suit. 
Generally, it makes sense to play the lowest card you have then, because you can't win the round. Okay, so I don't have an authorization card. So I'm going to play a cornucopia card, number three. Okay. So this says that Andrew can access source code, decompile, or otherwise access business logic to understand how the application works and any secrets contain. So I guess in this case, this is probably talking more about an internal employee because the code that's on the front end is accessible by any user through the browser. So this will probably be talking about an internal employee who has access to our backend source code and making sure that we close off that access once they've left the company. So I know account management, you know, they get notified through HR that someone has been terminated or left the organisation, at which point their AD account is disabled. Um, so I don't think that's a valid attack, really. What about in the case of some of the third party contractors that we use? So they will have the same access to the source code through their accounts, but if they're using their own device, then they would have downloaded the source code onto the device where we have no access to make sure that it's removed once they've left. Yeah, that's true. So there might be an area we can look into that process and see how we close off every piece of access once someone's left the company. Yeah. So, agreed? Yeah. Do you think of any reason, any ways to do that? Not currently, unless, unless we have all the code placed in kind of a sandbox application on the third party developer's laptop, but as it's their own machine, I'm not sure how much we can restrict where they put the code on there. So potentially want to restrict how much they can check out. You know, can they check out the full code base um, or can they only check out a specific branch, etc.? Okay, well, there's a, uh, quite a bit of discussion about what we should do here. I think we agree there's something we must do. Um, I'm going to write down protecting source code for, uh, you know, protecting access to source code repositories, and then we'll figure out what exactly we need to do, possibly get security architecture involved in that. <laughs> Cornucopia card was played. It is not the same suit, so we're still looking at authorization cards, and the four of authorization is still in the lead. Sure. Matt, if you have authorization, please play. Yeah, so I have the queen of authorization. Um, so that card is uh, Christopher can inject a command that the application will run at a higher privilege level. Um, so this could refer to if someone's able to use the same account at the uh, back end and then maybe at the uh, fulfillment service. So if we're using the same account, obviously the fulfillment service has higher privileges um, and that could potentially pose a threat. That's right, because I think everything runs under the same user account on the back end, even the, the file copies do. So I'm going to write down that we raise, we need to raise privileges for the fulfillment copy as late as possible. Han, can you beat the Queen? Well, I do have an authorization card, but unfortunately it's only a two. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I can't. Okay, so this attack is Tim can influence where data is sent or forwarded to. I was thinking perhaps a, an external user might be able to uh, through the application, maybe inject something into the database um, and that might be able to manipulate where we pull or push data from. Possibly. I mean, this is talking more about sending data rather than receiving data. Well, in that case, I think maybe the, the biggest uh, risk was probably going to be the payment gateway then. Um, so I don't know if... Uh, if there's something that could be done there, perhaps um, we have to make sure that the back end can only speak to our payment gateway and it's locked down so it can't talk to anywhere else. Yeah. Perhaps secure DNS. Yeah, that'd be really bad if you know someone could change that URL and redirect someone to enter their credit card details on a, a different payment gateway and ultimately you know, we'll be liable for that. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna write down ensure that the redirect to the payment gateway is secure. And score Hannah for the round. Okay. So, at the end of the round, Matt played the queen. 
So he wins the round as well. Yes. Nice. <laughs> that means, Matt, that you get to pick the suit for the next round. You can see playing high cards does get you a bit of a win because you get to choose what the next game is. Yeah. Okay. also have a data validation and encoding card and it is the ace. <laughs> oh. So I have invented a new attack against data validation and encoding. Aces are wild cards within the suit, which means that you have to come up with an attack that is more dangerous than Chris's attack, but it is a high card, so it will trump the king as long as your attack is a valid one and potentially more dangerous than the one that Chris has already mentioned. So what attack do you okay. see potentially being more dangerous than the fact that... So, I guess similarly to the last attack, in our fulfillment service, if we're not validating that product codes that are being received are in fact for products that exist, an attacker might be able to submit a fake order for a product that doesn't exist, which would cause the fulfillment service to error as it doesn't know what to do with that order. And then that may cause some things further down the chain to fail as well and cause the whole site to fail. I do have a data validation card. I've got the queen. That is referring to Jeff being able to inject data into a client or device side interpreter because a parameterized interface is not being used or has not been implemented correctly. Or the, the data has not been encoded correctly for the context or there is no restrictive policy on code or data includes. Um, so basically we're not validating data properly from the client side. So a bit like Chris's, but yep. just on the client side. So that is literally the difference between those two cards. The queen is talking about client side data validation. And if, obviously, if Chris's attack is possible, yours must be too. Mm -hmm. um, what's the solution? What's the fix on the client side? So again, similar to the fix for the server side, just doing some validation, but this time on the client side, um, just yeah, validating any data that's in inputted. So the same thing. I have a question for you guys. If we do the input validation on the client side, do we need to worry about the, the back end? Absolutely. So always layer security controls. Um, if, if one fails, then you're reliant on the secondary, you know, third, fourth, etc., to try and pick up on these things. So again, we're layering that approach, um, yeah. defense in depth. This entire suit is about those trust boundaries. So understanding where you can trust data coming from, maybe from one function to another function, but definitely when we move from back end to front end, or when we move from database to back end. These are all untrusted areas because we don't know where the data's come from. Five, six, seven points for you, Chris. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight points for you, Aaron. Two, three, four, five, six, seven for you, Matt. One, two, three, four, five, six points for you, Hannah. That makes you the winner, Aaron. Well done. Yes. <laughs> So we have our to-do list, the things that, all the things we need to get done. I'll pull out of here the things that need to be stories to go into JIRA. Um, and then uh, we'll leave them up to the product owner to prioritize. Then we can get stuck into whatever it is we need to do. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the session. Mm -hmm.